on Thursday, it'll be 10 years to the day since former footballer Fabrice Mwamba suffered a cardiac arrest on the pitch of Tottenham Hotspur's White Hart Lane. After he collapsed in front of thousands of shock spectators, medics battled for an astonishing 78 minutes to get his heart beating again and twice considered declaring him dead. Well, as he continues to reflect on his miracle recovery, he joins us now and it's lovely to see you. Yeah, uh, thank you me. very much for coming in today. Um, 10 years, that's gone past quickly, hasn't it? Eh? Yes, it has been a whirlwind experience, you can say, 10 years and things have changed. Uh, I said that many times, I'm OK, I'm enjoying life, you know, so I can't complain. What, um, what do you remember of, of that day? Um, you remember just going to the game as per usual, um, looking, up for, looking forward to playing the game. And then when the game started, that I said many times before, that uh, if I get to focus on you, I see double view. So my vision become very blurry. And out of nowhere, I just fell down. That was the last time I was able to... Before play. that, though, you found the way to the stadium? No, there was not... You felt no, fit and healthy? Fit, I was healthy. I was, there was no, no problem at all. No. So your heart stopped beating for 78 minutes and twice they thought about declaring you dead. I mean, how grateful must you have felt, felt to those paramedics that day? Uh, I've, I've, I've got a very good relationship with all those guys. That's including the ambulance crew, um, the doctors from both clubs, and I stay in touch with them. Um, the lady that works in NHS that looked oh. after me. So everybody that's did the job in the day, yeah. I very much still speak to them. So from 2012, you still keep in contact oh, yeah, yeah, with, those, yeah, yeah. With, with, with all the Definitely medical staff that. that saved your life that Peter, day? Peter, who works for Ambulance, uh, Jonathan Toby, who was my doctor at Bolton, Peter, uh, the doctors at Spurs, so I still have a very, very good relationship with them. So. Well, you, um, I mean, you talk about the stars being in alignment, if that's going to happen, mm -hmm. and nobody wants that to happen, obviously, but if you were in the right place for it to happen, because um, in the watching, a fan um, was a consultant cardiologist and Tottenham fan, Dr Andrew Diener. Yeah. Um, you had 15 defibrillator shocks in total, two pitch side, one in the tunnel, 12 in the ambulance, um, but the ambulance, because it was a match and they're always yeah. on, on call and ready, the ambulance was 10 seconds away, so yeah. you know, all of that, incredible. When you got to hospital and all the amazing care that you had, the, what was, when was the moment that you realised how serious it was and what had happened to you? I mean, after I woke up, and, and there were so many people coming in around my room to see me, but nobody wanted to actually tell me exactly what happened to me. And then Dr Andrew coming in, you know, it was just me and him. And we had a conversation and he just went in detail exactly what happened. And I was like, kind of taken back from it, you know? So I knew how deep in trouble I was, but I didn't realize how deep the trouble I was in, you know? So, and then he explained to me in a way that it didn't crush my hope, but I just said, listen, the most important thing is still here. Mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, obviously my wife was also next to me just to console me because when you're in that circumstance, your emotions all over the place, and so you need your family to be there, and she was very, very much a huge instrument. And you were fitted with a pacemaker. Yes. At what point were you fitted with the pacemaker? Uh, three weeks after I, I woke up and everything was settled, and then um, I had to decide if I want to... Well, the idea to have a pacemaker was more like, if I want to go carry on and playing, mm. the only way I was allowed to play was having a pacemaker put in. And to be honest with you, it's the best decision I ever make. So yeah. I don't right. regret it at all. Well, you went to, it was Belgium, I think, yes. wasn't it? Well, I saw a specialist in Belgium. And it was, it was that specialist that said, you, you shouldn't play. Yeah, but not even that. It's just that um, I saw the guy in London Bridge, and Professor Schilling, who implanted my thing, he just said, listen, I advise you to use, don't bother to go back. Just to have a second opinion, going to Belgium from this guy who created a pacemaker himself, he said, listen, you going back is like you're running to your own grave. So there's no point fighting it. So even though it's a hard pill to swallow, but uh, for me, it's better to be safe than to be sorry. And this is a genetic defect? Uh, I mean, I, I don't know in terms of people down the line, my family or my father or his father or done nothing, but just that because it's happened to me, yeah. I've got to make sure I protect my children. Yeah. So I have to, every single year, I have to go to Great Homerton Hospital just to get a regular checkup, just to see if they're okay as well. Well, the, your, your children, so you've got Joshua, who's 13, and Matthew, who's 8, and Gabriel, who's 5. Yeah. Um, they um, have sporting dreams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So does that impact your decision on them? 
Yes, of course. I, I, I prefer them to be safe than sorry, as I said earlier. But uh, in terms of me pushing them to play sport, I never force them to play sport. If they want to play sport, sure. that's fine. But I just want my children to be something that I wasn't now. So in terms of football, I've already I've done the hard work. Mm -hmm. They can do something else rather than just become a footballer. As I said earlier, football is great, but it's a short career. You don't play to your 40 or 50. You play to your 37, 33. You don't know. Otherwise, if you have a, a professional career, then you can have, have, have a happy life. And I always say to my children, whatever you do, I'll advise you, I'll, I'll be there for you, and I'll support you 100%. Oh, lovely. Yeah. What was going through your mind when you saw Christian Eriksen have, um, um, have his cardiac arrest at the Euros? We were at a family barbecue, and I, everybody was outside. I was watching the game. Then to see it happen, yeah. you almost, like, in my head, I'm thinking, please, I hope not. I really hope not. And I was just happy that by the time he left the pitch, he was awake. Right. You know, and that's the biggest relief for me. I just, and the, the biggest thing came out of Euro that, that year is that after anything happened, Christian being healthy and safe, mm. that's the best thing that ever can happen at Euros. What you are doing, um, which is so vital, uh, is you are campaigning for more defibrillators. Yeah. You know, as we as we heard, you know, sort of you had 15 shocks. It's literally, you know, that that piece of kit saved your life uh, and the people around you. Um, and also not just having the defibrillators, but knowing how to use yes. them. I mean, with, with a defibrillator, I think the way we have fire distinguished in every building, I think it should be mandatory that kids in school should know how to do CPR, kids in school to know how to use a defibrillator, because you don't realise how important it is to you find somebody or your loved one in that difficult circumstance, and you need to use a defibrillator. And I think it's a, it's a skill that it's been overlooked and barely been, no, you know, been spoken about. And I think something like that, it has to be taken serious. And we see every single year, we see, there's a, you know, we see in, in the Premier League game where people collapse in the stand, and there's a fan who helping each other. So everybody has a role to play. It's all about people being educated and then also using the, being, have the best, best access to a defibrillator. Uh, and thank God everybody was there that day and they all <laughs> knew their role to play. Um, now, you've had a big role to play. You've always been very, very active, but obviously in your recovery, you couldn't, you know, carry on with that activity anymore? Was it hard? Uh, yes, because obviously my life was more of a, I wake up in the morning, seven to eight, I get ready, nine o'clock, I get training. So to change your routine, it was, mm. a bit, it was a big one, a huge one. But as time goes on, you start to find a routine, you know, take the kids to school, all that kind of stuff. So that's, that's great. Well, you've, you've, you haven't given it up because no, uh, you're a brilliant player uh, and passing that knowledge on to younger yeah. players and you've been working with, uh, with younger players. You're at, uh, hopefully at Bolton in the, in the summer? Yes, yeah, so we've had a conversation uh, and then it looks very promising. I'm hoping to, to get back in there and hopefully I can come and help the football club because I said people of Bolton, they were great towards me and I have a huge affiliation with the club. And I said, I'm coming, I'm coming to help the club go and move forward. Oh, it's lovely to see you for both. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for thank coming you. in and well. sharing that with us today because it was a massive day. And, a, and to relive it mm. all the time is, yeah. Well, you've only watched that footage once. We decided not to play it today, but you've right. only watched that once. And That's the, fine. You know, you, know, you know what happened, you've been told. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.